21st Precinct, Sergeant Burns. Stole your what? Your safe? Well, where is this? Where on Lexington? What is it, a store? You're in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. When did you You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right, the officers will be right over there. That's right. Just stay there. The officers will be right there. Yeah, right away. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st. 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. Tours vary like the weather. Some are calm... Eight hours with hardly a murmur in the precinct. Others are stony. The switchboard hums continuously, and the sector cars hurry from one run to another. This tour was a stony one. When I came on the job at 7.30 a.m., a three-alarm fire in an old brewery near the East River had just been brought under control. Two city firemen had been overcome and taken to Metropolitan Hospital. At 8.16 a.m., a bus and a taxi cab collided on 2nd Avenue. The driver of the cab and his two passengers were injured. Shortly after 9 o'clock, there was a call that a paint store on Lexington Avenue had been burglarized during the night. I was still at the scene of the accident when Patrolman Farrell, my operator, rang into T.S. from a call box and informed me of the burglary. We made the run to Lexington Avenue. The men from Sector 4 and Sergeant Burns were already on the job. Farrell parked between their cars in front of the paint store. You stay with the car, Farrell. Oh, hello, Captain. Well, what have we got, Ross? Safe job, sir. Yeah? Uh-huh. Yes, they hauled it away. They just rolled it out the front door and carried it away. All right. Well, watch the door, Captain. That's the way they got in and out. Okay. Uh, Sergeant Byrne says the detectives might want to try it for fingerprints. All right. Stay on the job here. Keep the sidewall clear. Yes, sir. What time do you usually open the store, Mr. Hewlett? The same time, 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock every day. Hello, Sergeant. Captain. Mr. Hewlett, this is Captain Kennelly. Oh, I have some mess to come to work to. Some mess. Mr. Hewlett is a proprietor, Captain, Mr. George Hewlett. He opened up this morning and found the place had been burglarized during the night. The whole safe they took. The whole safe. Well, you'd think the safe would be safe. The whole thing. Did you uh, notify the detective, Sergeant? Yes, sir. I rang in as soon as I saw what it was. T.S. called upstairs to Vitaly. He was catching. He notified the safe and lock squad. He's, he's on the way over here himself. Well, where was the safe? Uh, right back here, Captain. Right back here in plain view. With a light on it. I always make a practice to leave a light on it. It's right here, in, in between brushes and wallpaper. What kind of safe was it, Mr. Hillis? A black one. No, no, I mean, do you know the name of the manufacturer and the style number? Oh, well, uh, to tell you the truth, no. Well, when did you buy it? Well, let's see, uh, I had it when I removed to this location. Had it about a year then. I've been here, uh, nine years, so I got the safe about ten. Well, it's important that the detectives have a description of the safe. Don't you have the manufacturer's name and the model number written down someplace? Well, yes, to tell you the truth, I think I do. I think I got the original invoice from when I bought it. Well, good. That's all they'll need. Where is this invoice? Uh, in the safe. That figures. How was the entry made, Sergeant? The, the street door was jimmied, sir. It was a neat job. I got a bar in between the door and the frame and just snapped off the latch. Yeah. Now, when I walked up to the door, I could see something was screwy, Captain. I just touched it and it opened. The lock was broken off. Listen, I got my insurance policies in the safe, too. How does that make me stand on insurance? Well, you don't need your policy. Just get in touch with your broker. Do you have any cash in the safe? Oh, yeah, sure. That's why I keep the safe primarily. How much? Oh, six, seven hundred dollars Your receipts from yesterday? Well, well most of it. Uh, four, four fifty is the receipt from yesterday. The rest is uh, extra cash I keep around. Why? Why? Uh, well, uh, tell you the truth, Captain, uh, it's a couple of hundred dollars I had. I didn't want my wife to know about. You know, mad money. She knows everything I'm doing, how much I got in the bank down to the last nickel. You see, I'm the president, and she's secretary and treasurer of this little corporation we got, Hillis Bates Incorporated. And she takes her job seriously, and I figured I'm entitled to a couple hundred dollars she don't know anything about. What is it, six or seven hundred dollars? I've got to have them definite for a report. Well, between, I don't know. I have to check the register and so forth. Well, what else did you have in there, Mr. Hillis? Oh, a couple of dollars in stamps. Oh, for crying out loud. My 
war bonds. My war bonds was in there. Well, you won't lose anything there. You have a record of the serial numbers. Oh, yeah. Uh, also in the safe. Mm. You sure had a lot of faith in that safe, Mr. Healer. Well, who would have thought, you know? Listen, the government will make good on those, won't they? That, that's my hard-earned money in those bonds. What happened? Well, you better get in touch with the Treasury Department as soon as you can, Mr. Healer. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. As a matter of fact, we'll notify them ourselves. Anything else from there, Mr. Healer? Uh, my account's receivable. Listen, how much chance is there of getting them back? I, I mean, the bonds and the accounts receivable. I don't care about the cash. You know, this could develop into an expensive proposition. The Treasury might give me a hard time, and without the accounts receivable, well, to tell you the truth, I'm a dead duck. Accounts payable, who cares? The people I owe, if I don't pay them, they'll let me know. But the people that owe me aren't going to come around here and volunteer the money. No, sirree. You think I can get it back, Captain, the contents? Besides the cash, I mean? You probably will, Mr. Hillis. All they want is the cash. Your ledgers and war bonds won't do them any good. Oh, that's good news if it only comes true. What do they do, Sergeant? Roll it along here? Yes, sir, you can see the tracks. Right down here and out the door. Must have had a pickup truck or a, or a car waiting. A car? Well, they couldn't get that safe into a car. You know how big that safe is? Why, well, it comes up to here. I'm up to here. Well, there must have been nine guys to move it. Look, look, I haven't had it out of that corner for two years. It was so heavy. Look at the dust back there. Are you in the store all alone, Mr. Healers? That's right, all alone. Oh, except on, on, on Saturdays, my wife comes down to give me a hand and work on the books. You know, she's got a job downtown on Wall Street. On Saturdays, she comes to help me out. Mm -hmm. Have you always been alone in the store? Well, yeah, for the last three or four years. I used to have help, but it got more than the traffic could bear. I couldn't keep them. I always had their problems, plus my own. I figured it didn't pay. Twelve guys there must have been to roll that safe out of here. Believe me, it was this big, this big, and heavy. Now, who could that be on the phone? It's a fine time to call. Well, you better answer it, Mr. Healy. Well, it's a fine time for business as usual. Go ahead. Yeah, oh, excuse me. Some deal, huh, Captain? Ah, it is some deal. I had to jimmy the door. They had to roll the safe out here across the sidewalk and onto the truck. Why was the patrolman on post? Beats me, Captain. Hello, Hillis. What time do you think they broke in, Sergeant? Oh. They closed the store at 6 o'clock. Didn't open up until 9 this morning. It could have been any time in between. All right. Sergeant. All right. Send forthwith to the men who were on post here for the night tour and for the late tour. I want them both in my office by noon. Yes, sir. I want to know why they didn't see this burglary in progress or at least discover that the door was Jimmy. And listen, Captain, that telephone's for you. For me? Yeah, yeah, I answered it and somebody says, who's the cop in charge there? It was a dame, some dame. And I said, there's a captain here. And she said, let me talk to the captain. All right, where is it? Yeah, back down the counter, right next to the cash register. Okay. You don't need all those men here, Sergeant. Get some of them back on patrol. Yes, sir. Captain Kennelly. Are you in charge of the cops there? Who is this? Well, that's not important now, Captain. And if you want to talk to me, it's important. Well, look, if you really want to know who it is, I'm the guy that's got the safe from there. Is that so? Yeah, that's so. I don't want to make you a little proposition. Well, I don't know whether I want to talk about a proposition with you. Well, whatever we talk about, let's make it fast. I don't want to give you a chance to find out where I'm calling from. All right, I'll make it fast. What do you want? I want the combination. <laughs> you don't want much, do you? Look, we've been trying to get into that thing all night. We've been trying to rip it. We've been using the torch on it. All we want is the dough, that's all. Well, that's very nice of you. The deal is, you give it the combination. I know he's got a lot of other stuff in there he wants besides the money. But that's all I want, the money. Well, what's your proposition? Give it the combination and we'll leave the stuff where it can be picked up without getting hurt. We'll leave the whole safe. And if you don't get it? If we don't get it, the safe winds up the bottom of the river. And he'll never sees anything else he's got in there. That's fair, isn't it? How fair can you get? All right, just hold the phone a minute. No, no, I don't hold the phone. With... I'll call you back. Captain who? Captain Kennelly, 21st Precinct. I'll call you back there. Hello. Hello. Oh. What's the trouble, Captain? That was the burglar. The burglar? Did you say that was the burglar on the phone? Well, that's who he said he was. Well, what does he want? He wants the combination to the safe. Well, that's a lot of nerve. What does he think he is? He can't get it open. He said if he gets the combination, you'll recover everything else in the safe except the money. All he wants is the money. If he doesn't get it, the whole thing goes to the bottom of the river. You mean I could get my accounts receivable and my war bonds back? Well, that's what he said. Well, who cares about the money? I'm covered with insurance for that. I'll go along with him. I'm inclined to do that. Well, I don't know whether I am, Mr. Healer. Now, look, whose stuff is it? I got a lot to lose. Let's we'll talk it over with the detectives. We'll see what they want to do about it. I've been a long time in this job, Captain. I never heard of anything like this before. Well, you learn something new every day, Sergeant. Every day in the year. Within a few minutes, detectives of both the 21st Squad and the Safe Loft and Truck Squad, the central office specialists who handle safe burglaries on a citywide basis, arrived at the scene. Sergeant Burns gave them such information as he had collected, and I told them of the phone call from the man who purported to be one of the burglars. The detectives took over the investigation, and Sergeant Burns instructed his men to resume patrol. I returned to the precinct house. 
Lieutenant Gorman told me he had sent forthwith to the homes of Patrolman Coley and White. These were the men who were on post number six, which included the burglarized paint store during the preceding night and late tours. Both men were en route from their homes. I went into my office to read and sign reports and communications which had accumulated since I was on duty previously. At 20 minutes after 10, I had almost finished with the paperwork. When I looked up and saw Lieutenant Matt King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad, and another man standing in the door. You got a minute, Captain? Yeah, sure, Matt. Come in. How are you, Captain? Fine, man. This is Detective Andy Sawyer of the Safe and Lost Squad. I'm oh, glad to know you, Sawyer. Yes, sir. Sit down. Matt, sit down. Thank you. Pull that chair over. Well, that was an odd one this morning, wasn't it, Captain? Yeah, it sure was. How do you figure it, Sawyer? You fellows ever heard anything like that before? No, sir. Neither do I. I must be a psycho trying to swing a deal like that. Well, it didn't sound much like a psycho over the phone, Matt. How have you fellows got it figured? Well, there are a couple of things, Captain. One, Mr. Healer said it was a woman on the phone when he answered. You picked it up. It was a man. Yeah, that's right. Two, from the description Healers gave us of the box, it sounds like a certified 600. Now, a safe man who really knows his business wouldn't find much trouble getting into a box like that. He'd try ripping it. And if that didn't work, he'd use a cutting torch and get inside of it that way, especially since they carried it off and can work on it at their leisure. Now, they aren't red-hot ironmen, that's for sure. Whoever they are, I don't think they've been long on trade. Well, uh, how many do you think there were? Well, the box weighs 600 pounds. There must have been at least three of them, maybe four. And what about the girl on the phone? I don't know, Captain. You know, I've got an idea about that. Yes, sir. Well, if this burglar was going to put the proposition to someone, who'd be the logical person? Not the cops on the job. That's right. The logical one would have been Helis. I don't think he wanted to talk to Helis. That's why he had the girl put in the call. You mean Helis might have recognized his voice? Mm -hmm. He might have. Yes, sir, that's a good possibility. But why the girl? There must have been at least two other men on the deal. Why the girl? Well, I don't know. Any number of reasons. Andy, do you think we ought to check out some of the people Helis knows? That's a good idea, Lieutenant. He said he used to have help in the store, but not anymore. How about his former employees? Yes, sir, it might be something there. Are you going to be around here all day? I well, was going out on patrol again this afternoon, that's all. Why? Well, we figured that guy might call back here to see if the deal will go through. Well, what do you want me to do? Well, if he does, we've got the switchboard here. I'll be right out there. I'll keep one line open to the telephone company to get the location of the phone he's calling from. I'll have CB keep up a direct connection to the radio dispatcher. As soon as we can get the location, he'll have a car right over there. Well, he won't stay on the phone long enough. He wouldn't this morning. He knows now that we're looking for his call. He's got to stay on long enough for you to give him the combination. Well, then, you want to go along with him? Yes, sir, we might as well. If it doesn't work and we don't get him, maybe at least Helis will get his property back. That's what he's most worried about anyway. And yeah, we'll be out at the board and start to work on every call that comes through to you, Captain, if that's all right. Yeah, that's all right. If you'll take just a few seconds longer to get to the phone than you normally do, we might have a chance. If he calls again. Well, Captain, he's got the safe. We've got the combination. If he had Moxie enough to carry that safe out across the sidewalk, he's got enough to make another telephone call. Squad stationed himself next to the telephone switchboard, ready to use another line to trace any subsequent call from the safe burglar. He got head starts on two callers who asked for me, but both of them turned out to be ordinary police business. At 11 o'clock, Patrolman Coley, who had worked a 4 p.m. to midnight tour on the post where the safe burglary occurred, came into the precinct house as ordered. I questioned him thoroughly regarding his activities on post during the previous night. At the end of the interview, I was convinced that the burglary had not occurred through his negligence. Patrolman Coley was allowed to return to his home. By 11.35, the safe burglar had still not been heard from again. I finished my paperwork and started out of the office and into the muster room when I saw Patrolman White, dressed in civilian clothes, standing at the desk talking to Lieutenant Gorman. He saw me and crossed the muster room. Excuse me, Captain. Hello, White. I got a force with to appear at the precinct house, Captain. Lieutenant Gorman said you put out the order. That's right. Come inside. Yes, sir. You were assigned to post number six from midnight to 8 a.m.? Yes, sir, that's right. Are you familiar with the paint store on Lexington Avenue run by Mr. George Healers? Yes, sir. That's on post number six. Did you have occasion to notice anything unusual at that paint store during your tour of duty? No, sir. Did you try the front door at all during your tour? Yes, sir. I did on my first time around. You saw nothing unusual during the balance of your tour? No, sir. Did you notice any truck parked on your post? No, sir. Sometime during the night, burglars jimmied the front door, got into the store, and rolled out a 600-pound safe. They rolled it out the front door, across the sidewalk, onto a truck. Where were you? 
I didn't see them, Captain. I know you didn't see them. I'm trying to find out why. Yes, sir. After your first time around, didn't you try the door again during the course of your tour? No, sir. Why not? Can you explain why you didn't? Yes, sir. Well, go ahead. Explain. That's what I'm waiting for. Well, sir, a little after 1 o'clock, there was some trouble over in a bar on 3rd Avenue. What kind of trouble? Two of the patrons got into a fight, Captain. One of them hit the other over the head with a beer bottle. This man was hurt pretty bad. I had to go to the hospital with him. Oh. What time did you get back on post? At 2.23, Captain. Well, did you start around again? Yes, sir. Did you try any front doors? Well, I started you, Captain, but it was along about that time that the alarm hit for this fire in the old brewery on the river. Yes? Well, Sergeant Collins drove by, sir. He instructed me to leave my post and go over to York Avenue. What did you do there? The fireman had a hose line struggling across York Avenue. There was about 30 pieces of apparatus there. I was instructed to reroute traffic on to 1st and 2nd. Well, how long did you stay there? Until I was relieved, Captain. What time was that? 20 minutes after 8 o'clock this morning, Captain. I came to the station house and changed to my civilian clothes, sir. Then I went home and went to bed. And that's where I was when I got the fourth whip. Okay, White. Well, you can go on back to bed. Yes, sir. Thank you, Captain. Oh, uh, White. Yes, sir, Captain. How long have you been in the job, White? I'm four months out of the academy, Captain. Do you know what Rule 107 is of the rules and regulations? I think so, sir. Well, what is it? Charges will be preferred against any patrolman who shall, through neglect of duty, fail to discover, report, and take appropriate action in connection with any act or conditions on his post requiring police attention during his tour of duty. Good. Don't forget it. No, sir, I won't. Okay. Go on home. Yes, sir. Thank you, Captain. Leave the door open. Captain Kennelly. Uh, Tony here, Captain. There's a call coming through for you. I think it's our boy. Oh, all right. If you hang up, sir, let it ring three or four times. All right. I think so. What about the deal? You ready to go through with it? Yes, we'll go through with it. All right, what's the combination? Now, wait a minute. First, I want your assurances that you're not going to throw that safe in the river. The man wants his property back. You'll get it back. Well, I just wanted to make First, sure. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to stall for time. I'm not going to stay on this line long enough for you to trace the call. Believe me, now I'm not. What's the combination? Well, just a second. Let me find it. Well, don't take more than a second. I'm telling you, don't take more than a second. All right, I'm getting it. Just a second. I'm telling you. All right, here it is. What? It's uh, two full turns to the right. Two full turns to the right. Write that down, honey. Stop at 71. Stop at 71. Back left past 71 and stop at 6. Back left past 71 and stop at 6. 6, 6. Then what? Now, look, you're going to keep your promise, aren't you? I'll keep my promise if you keep yours. What's the rest of the combination? I haven't got all day here. I know what you're trying to do. Well, then right to 98. Is that it? Yes, that's it. Bye. Hmm. I think we've got a chance, Captain. Well, I couldn't keep him on the phone any longer, Sawyer. He knew what we were up to. We made it, Captain. Good. That girl was with him again. Apparently, she was standing alongside of him, taking down the combination as he repeated it back. It was from a pay station. Ah, that figures. Drugstore on Astoria Boulevard. A car from the 114th Precinct's on the way. Well, that's fine. Maybe they'll make it. I'll call the squad out there and ask him to take a look, too. Okay. I'll do it for the board. Oh, excuse me, Lieutenant. That's all right. Go ahead. We uh, got the call, Lieutenant. Did you talk to him, Captain? Yeah. I gave him the combination. They traced it to a pay station in a drugstore on Astoria Boulevard. Yeah, well, he's probably gone by now. Yeah, a car is on the way, and Sawyer's calling out the 114th squad and have them go take a look, too. Astoria, huh? Ah, yeah, that's right. You know something, Captain? I've had Vitaly and Novak over there talking to that Mr. Hewis for the better part of the morning. Yeah. We've been going on the possibility that maybe your suggestion is correct. The man didn't want to talk to Mr. Hewis on the phone because he might recognize the voice. We asked him all about former employees and friends and relatives, anybody that he knew that was familiar with the store or worked there. Well, did you get anywhere? No, no place much, but one thing came out. What's that? He was his wife has a brother who's been in a little trouble. Oh, is that so? Yeah, he did one bit for Grand Larson. He's been out for two and a half, three years. Hasn't gotten jammed up again since. Mm -hmm. 
Eula said his brother-in-law used to clerk at the store on Saturdays once in a while. You know, just help him out a little bit. Yeah. Said he wasn't much account as a clerk. Didn't know varnish from enamel. Said he hasn't seen his brother-in-law in about seven or eight months. Doesn't think his wife has either. Well, that's nothing in itself, is it? Eulis would know his brother-in-law's voice over the telephone. Yeah. And his brother-in-law might think that Eulis is a pretty good mark. Well, it's a possibility, but you still don't have much, man. Do you know where he lives, the brother-in-law? Where? Astoria. Well, I guess you want to talk to him. Yes, sir. I guess we do. In another minute or so, Detective Sawyer came into my office and told me that he had spoken to the acting lieutenant in command of the 114th Squad. Two detectives from there were en route to the drugstore on Astoria Boulevard to see if they could locate the caller. It was determined that Detective Sawyer, accompanied by Detective Vitale of the 21st Squad, would go to Astoria and talk to the brother-in-law of the victim, Lee Goring. The fact that the brother-in-law lived in Astoria and had a criminal record was considered more than a coincidence. After they left my office, I turned my attention to other business at the precinct. At 1 p.m., I went on patrol and returned in time to turn out the platoon for the night tour at 4. The precinct was calmer than when I came on the job in the morning. The storm had abated. After the men marched out of the door, a call came from upstairs through T.S. Lieutenant King would like to see me in the detective squad. I walked through the back room where several of the men who had just come off duty were standing around talking. I climbed the rickety stairs to the second floor and walked into the 21st squad. I saw Detective Sawyer sitting on the edge of a desk talking to a small, blonde young woman. I walked over to him. Well, I was just doing him a favor. That's all I was doing. Hello, Sawyer. Oh, hello, Captain. How are you? After all, all he asked me to do was to make a telephone call for him. If a girl can't make a telephone call for a man, well, what's this world coming to? Captain, this is Eleanor Hoffel. How do you do? I'm sure. Well, I didn't have anything to do with breaking into that store. I wasn't anywhere near the place. I didn't even know what it was all about. He asked me to do him a favor, that's all, and I did. I didn't know what it was all about. He asked you to write down the combination, too, when he got it from the captain here. You knew what that was all about, didn't you? Well, not exactly. He's not the kind that tells you everything. Have you got it wrapped up, Andy? Yes, sir, pretty much. Vitaly and I went out to this house in Astoria. We found the brother-in-law out there and her. I told you, I was just visiting. That's all I was doing. I was just visiting. We took a look in the garage, and what do you think was there? The safe? Yes, sir. The mm -hmm. safe. I didn't know it was in there. I don't look in garages. Why should I look in a garage? I was just visiting him, and he asked me to do a favor. You can't kill somebody for doing a favor. Uh, where's the lieutenant in his office? Yes, sir. I didn't know what it was all about. That's the honest to goodness truth. Captain Kennelly. Come in, Captain. I thought you'd like to meet this man, Captain. You've talked to him over the phone. Lee Goring. Look, what are we waiting for? You got the safe, you got me. Book me, get it over with, will you? I'm tired. Because you were up all night last night? Because I was up all night last night, yeah. Wasn't a very smart thing to do, break into your brother-in-law's store, was it? That was smart enough. The stupid thing was leaving a safe in my garage. I should have found someplace else. And you find out who was with him on that deal last night, Ben? Yes, sir, he's told us. Sure, I told you. I told you everything. Why should I keep anything back? They walked out of me. You think I want to be in and them out? Not me, brother. I weaken easy. When I go down for the third time, I take everybody with me. Why'd you pick on your own brother-in-law? I wanted to keep the money in the family. That was thoughtful, wasn't it, Captain? Yeah, very. We're sending a truck out after the safe, Captain. I'm kind of anxious to see it. Mm -hmm. Sawyer told me they clawed at it, hacked at it, and burned it with a torch, tried to knock the knob off. They couldn't make a dent in it. Must be a pre-war safe. Did they build them like that today? Who's got a chance with one of those things? And it's work. You know that's work? To get it out of the store, onto the truck, and out to the garage, then to go to work on it? You know we worked on that thing from 3.30 this morning to almost 8. We couldn't make a dent in it? Is uh, that when you got the bright idea to call me? Yeah. Came over to New York, walked down the other side of Lexington Avenue to see what kind of rumble it was from the job. I saw all the cops' cars parked out in front. I went in the candy store and called. Who was with you, just Eleanor? Yeah, that's right, just Eleanor. I had the idea out in the garage, but the other boys thought I was crazy. They wouldn't have any part of it. I said to them, look... I'm not two feet from where all that money is. Not two feet, and I can't get my hands on it. If you don't want any part of it, get out. I'll go it myself. So they got out. All that work and not a dime out of it. That's what gets me. Back break and work. You gonna bring them in here, those boys? I like to see the looks on their faces. They take a fall, don't get a dime out of it. I'm, I'm laughing. It's a big joke. All right. Come in, Mr. Hewlett. Yeah, sure. I'm Lieutenant King. How are you? I'm pleased to know you. Lee, I don't know what to say. Say hello. I'm ashamed of you, Lee. Really ashamed of you. My own wife's brother to do such a thing. What do you want from me, George? I did it. What am I going to do? Say I'm sorry? You would really throw the safe from the river? Your own brother-in-law's accounts receivable in bonds at the bottom of the 
River. I can understand how you would do it to me, but your own flesh and blood is my wife. George, don't knock yourself out. Why did you do it, Lee? Why didn't you come to me if you needed money? I needed money, but who needed a song and dance with it? Captain, do you understand it? I don't. A grown man, look at him. In his trade, he can go out and make $20, $25 a day. $25 a day, and he's got to get himself in trouble again like this. What's the answer? $25 a day. Well, Mr. Helis, the answer seems to be that he prefers night work. Sergeant Burns. Well, who got bitten? How old? Four? Well, where's the dog? Is the dog there? Well, where is the dog? Where's that? Oh, I see. Well, what's the name of the girl who was bitten? W-E-A-L-D. And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct. A factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly... Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Larry Haynes and John Sylvester, Scott Tennyson, Wendell Holmes, William Flatley, and Joan Morgan. Written and directed by Stanley Ness. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hannah speaking.